Hello, I'm Bill Harris, and this is Life Questions, a program that addresses your questions about life from a biblical perspective. Our team of local ministers has been carefully reviewing the questions that you have sent us and researching through the Bible for answers to minister to you. Now, these pastors are all fired up and ready to go, so I want to introduce them to you right now. To begin, we have with us today Pastor Charlene Williams of New Life Church International in Lima, Ohio, followed by Pastor Tim Benjamin of Wayne Street United Methodist Church, St. Mary's. Then there's Pastor Tim Smith of St. Mary's Church of the Nazarene. And rounding off our panel today, we have Pastor Jim Stauffer of Trinity Evangelical Church in Upper Sandusky. We are happy to have you all with us today. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent, excellent. Well, to start off our discussion, and we have um, many questions that we've been reviewing here, um, I'd like to start off our discussion today if we could talk about this one question here, and that is Halloween. We're getting so close <laughs> to Halloween, and there's controversy within churches about whether to celebrate it, whether or not, whether to modify it or provide some alternative for children and the like. Uh, how say you? What about Halloween? For Christians? Um, I do not, um, I do not celebrate Halloween, mm -hmm. but I do an alternative because I, ha I, ha I have a child yes. <laughs> and he's seeing his other friends celebrating, he would want to know. So we, t we taught him from a biblical perspective that we can do biblical characters. We can, we can do the candy and all of that, mm -hmm. but we are teaching him um, from God's word, what God says about it. There's a spiritual dynamic to it also that mm -hmm. I think we need to understand and be wary of as believers, mm -hmm. uh, that we're not just thrusting our children out there without understanding uh -huh. some of the complications and implications of the spirit realm. Yes. Um, but I think the church can, I, don't, I wouldn't say celebrate or oh, Halloween, but have an alternative celebration mm -hmm. with biblical characters and what's not for the children. Excellent. We can be creative. Excellent. Who's next? Yeah, I'm certainly not against it. And, and I think it's a great point of teaching in the church to help people understand what we do and don't do. Uh, and so I draw a line at demons and devils and death as a, something we celebrate. But I think like a, lot of like a lot of celebrations, a lot of holidays, Halloween has roots that allow the church to speak about what we do believe. And so a lot of churches will celebrate All Saints Day mm -hmm. or All Hallows Day, mm -hmm. which is where that tradition of Halloween sort of developed out of as well. Mm -hmm. And so to talk about the hope of heaven and the reality of death, not as something to be scared of, mm -hmm. but as something to really have a gospel message to speak to. Mm -hmm. So I let my kids go trick or treating and they get Halloween candy. Mm -hmm. But in church on Sunday, we also talk about the glory of God and the promise mm -hmm. of heaven and the reality of spiritual battle, mm -hmm. which I think in the world is a great uh, connection as folks who don't know God, mm -hmm. you know, have that pagan celebration of Halloween. Mm -hmm. I yeah, agree. I think uh, I think if I don't chime in on this question, people from my church are going to have my head. I, uh, <laughs> I'm a huge fan of uh, you know, uh, kid, you know, comic book characters and, and Batman and, and all those things, and, and I, I don't I don't see the problem with that. Of course, I don't want to celebrate demons and death like you're talking right. about. Absolutely, right. but. Right. You know, at our church, we have a trunk or treat. I know yeah. you guys do too. Yes. And, uh, you know, just uh, all this, have kids come through. It's an outreach to the community. You know, mm -hmm. kids eating candy and they're dressed up like Spider-Man or whatever. And I don't have a problem with that as long as we're keeping it in perspective. It's just a celebration. It's just for fun. We're not trying to terrorize anybody. We're not talking about Freddy Krueger or Jason or anything like that. <laughs> we're trying to keep it on the, on the up and up. And um, I think it would be, uh, you know, uh, uh, slightly... Um, counterproductive for us to say yeah. you know we can't celebrate some of these yeah. cultural yeah. things yeah. Yeah. I mean yeah. our cameraman right back here has Darth Vader on his t-shirt so I mean I, th I think <laughs> I think that we all embrace those characters and we enjoy them greatly so because yeah. again the culture a lot of these things were Christian before right. oh, they yes. became oh, cultural yes. oh, absolutely yes. and so oh, the yes. idea of lifting up death as something that we shouldn't be scared of started with the church and I think the reaction of the world what we see a lot of times is all of that death and horror absolutely without Christ right and so to speak a word into the world of what death looks like when you know Christ is a huge opportunity in this time of the year and so to be sensitive and graceful right to be gentle with sure. the world as they celebrate without Christ is an important part of the church's evangelism in the world today mm -hmm. Well, we, as you mentioned, we, we have a trunk or treat, and uh, 
uh, we have what 300 kids yeah. come through every year mm -hmm. just just like they do mm -hmm. and one of the things we did last year was the first time we'd done it but we actually uh, gave out Gideon Bibles to every kid that mm -hmm. came through mm -hmm. and we got a, a boxes of them and uh, it was a, a we we tried to turn the cultural focus on death into an opportunity to speak life okay very well there we are okay well let's move on to the next question then uh, unless you have something you want to add. You want to have anything I, think, to I think we did. Yeah, we did good. Exhausted yeah. it well. I think we exhausted it well. Um, the question comes up that bring, th this question can bring um, um, reservations over people's minds about themselves. Uh, is doubt a sin? Hmm. Is doubt a sin? Is it a sin to actually doubt? And you all, I can see, I can see the wheels turning in your mind. My, my favorite answer to this question is you cannot doubt what you do not believe. And so in that thinking, mm. doubt is a sign of belief. Because if you didn't believe it, you, right, wouldn't, you wouldn't doubt, it. doubt it. it. Makes sense. And so when you feel that sense of doubt, it's in, in a strange way, an affirmation of the fact that you do believe it. You're just struggling with that sometimes intellectual grasp mm -hmm. of it. So I encourage people to know that doubt is a great tool of growing in your faith. Uh, it's not a sin, it's not a sign of disbelief, but a sign of your wrestling through the immensity sometimes of all these issues that we have as followers of a God who's beyond our imagination. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't know if we can say it any better than that. I know. Yeah. Well, I'm just reminded of the, the, the man who had the came to Jesus, brought his son who was mm -hmm. demon possessed and Jesus said, if you believe, and he said, I, I believe, help my unbelief. Mm -hmm. And I think we, we all find ourselves in that situation often. Uh, it's a situation of doubt, and we're, we're, we have the privilege of calling on God and asking him to help us believe in a deeper way. And, and not know, only calling upon God and, and have repercussions to that, but being embraced by Jesus as that man was. Right. All right, well, let's go on to the next question here from our viewers. Could uh, doubt therefore hinder uh, blessing? Could doubt therefore hinder answers uh, from coming, like the gentleman we spoke about? Uh, Jesus said, if you believe, if you don't doubt, it's going to happen. So if you doubt, then it was not going to happen. So in answer to your um, response, how would you, how would you address that? Yeah, well, and I think that's where sometimes that definition of doubt is important. Yeah, yeah. You know, if, it, if it's just an uncertainty in your soul, the good news is God doesn't change, right? So, so the answers aren't dependent upon your certainty, but the reality of who God is. Mm -hmm. But I think there are times when, if it's not simply doubt, but actually a refusal to believe. Mm -hmm. I think when, you know, when the book of James says, those who doubt are you know, tossed back and forth to and fro, mm -hmm. I think that's a doubt that, that, that is a, an unbelief, a, a willful unbelief, which I think is a different sort of definition than what I see for most people who say, I feel bad because I doubt, and I tell them, you doubt because you really want to believe. And so uh, that, that willful unbelief is a negative. Yeah, it's, it's, doubt becomes a weapon used against God. Mm. If, you don't, if you don't acquiesce this, then I'm not gonna believe anymore. And I, I think that's it, I, I've seen that, and I know you guys have too, where people will use doubt as a weapon against God to get their way, and that, that goes a bad direction. Is doubt synonymous with a lack of faith. It could be, and I think that's hard. I think as much like the man who came and said, help my unbelief, I think that's the struggle for all of us who just have faith as big as a mustard seed. It never feels like enough. Um, and, and when we don't get the answer we want, we wanna somehow feel responsible for that. And I think that's again, mm -hmm. a dangerous mm -hmm. place where we feel responsible mm -hmm. uh, rather than trusting God with what we turn over to him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's why we have a God that is so conscious of our frailties mm. and our insufficiencies that when we call on him in that moment when our belief has not measured up to his expectations that we have a God that can make up the edge like the gentleman mm -hmm. said Lord help my unbelief um, to the person that asked the question could we therefore say instead of seeing it as a sin or not a sin that we see the God in it to say, Father, I don't really understand everything. Right. 
there is some grayness going on there. There is some doubt, there's some fears. Can I tap in more to your strengths? Yeah, that opportunity for growth. For growth. Is what that doubt can That's do in the is. best of circumstances. Mm -hmm. Isn't that, it just comforts me to know this is the God that we serve. Mm -hmm. That he's a God that can make up the edge and help us when we're at our, at our lowest points. So we don't have to let that doubt become a sense of condemnation or a lack of faith become that sense of condemnation. But we can tap in, we can call on him in any singular place, in any moment and say, Father, I don't understand what's happening, but I need your help. I need your strength and growth occurs. So when the next situation comes, you remember what he did for you before. And instead of doubt, now it becomes faith. Mm -hmm. Okay. Very good, very good. Now, on another question we got from our viewing audience, does God love Satan? <laughs> After all, Satan was an angel. At one point, he was God's choice angel, decided to rebel against God and was kicked out of heaven along with about a third of the population of heaven at the time that joined him in that plot, unsuccessful plot to try to overthrow God. So does God hate Satan? Is there anything that we can point to, to say one way or the other? I feel like we're serving, not I feel. The Word of God says our God is an unchanging God. Mm -hmm. He doesn't shift. We may discover more of him, but he doesn't change. And from the beginning, he loved Satan. That's why he had him as one of his own. Joy yeah. But he will not tolerate sin. He right. is a God that will deal with sin. And Satan did not repent. And so the best way God could have dealt with him is put him where he is, let him out of heaven. Mm -hmm. So I believe he still loves him, but because he, he never changed. Yeah, yeah. Well, the, the, most, the most famous verse in the Bible is John three sixteen. for God yeah. so loved the world. I mean, I don't, I don't, hear, any, I don't hear the word exception in there. Yeah. So I, I think Satan would certainly fit under that. However, God loves Satan enough to let him make up his own mind. Yes. And if he wants to choose self-destruction, he'll let Satan have the opportunity to choose that same way all the rest of us have. Yes. Not sure I'd recommend that direction, but, <laughs> but it's something a lot of yeah. people choose. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, I agree. Evan, you want to add to that? I, I, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> I think that was well said. All right, well then let's take a break right now. We'll come back for more discussion right after this. Stay with us. Don't go away, there's still a lot more discussion to come on this episode of Life Questions. But first, do you have a question for a future show? Email it to lifequestions at WTLW.com or call us 419-339-4444. You can also suggest pastures you feel would be a good fit for our panel. Again, send your question ideas and pastor suggestions to lifequestions at WTLW.com. Now back to the discussion. All right, we're back and we have another question from our viewing audience. This one, I think, a really, really good one here. How do you know God is here? I can't see him or feel him, and honestly, life is just hard. How do you address that? That's, that's a real life question. Yeah. It really is. Uh, you know, I, I think about, uh, you know, some, somebody who understood very clearly how hard life was was the prophet Jeremiah. I mean, he went through a lot of, he was known as the weeping prophet. You read his whole book, very little good news in those 50 some odd chapters in there. But he does have one verse uh, that we all know, 2911, for I know oh, the plans yeah. I have for you, says the Lord, plans to prosper you and build you up. And, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and, I, and I think in the midst of that, he, he embraced God's plan, even though he was not a fan of it, he hated it. But in the midst of that terrible situation, you know, he, he believed God enough to even go out and purchase property that was going to be for his when he came back from, from exile. And I just. I think, I think for Jeremiah, it wasn't about what I was feeling. It certainly wasn't about what he was experiencing. It was what I knew in my head to be true. And I know God is there and that sustained him through. It wasn't about how happy he was, because he certainly was not. Mm -hmm. But that, that brought him through some really dark times in his life. Mm -hmm. well, again, that question, how, how do we know God well, is there? Uh, I think part of the question assumes that uh, the basis of our reality and our decisions is our feelings. Mm -hmm. And that's a really poor place to make decisions about what's true and what's not. Um, that's one of the reasons our culture is 
is where we're at is because we make so many decisions based upon how it's I true. feel at the moment. And it's, it's just a false way to live. Um, so you, we have to base on the reality of God. And as you look around, just creation itself is, is witness to who God is. And uh, you mentioned Jeremiah. Uh, likewise, in his book of Lamentations, mm -hmm. the entire book, you know, was written as Jerusalem is being destroyed, and he's writing about what he sees. The center piece, the cent the very central verse of that, is uh, in chapter three. He says, uh, "Your mercies are new every morning." Mm -hmm. It's it's just it's all although everything else around me is going to pot. Um, I know that your mercies are new every morning, mm -hmm. and he depended upon that and lived in that reality. Yeah. You know, I've often, maybe this isn't biblical, but I've often thought about that verse, that, you know, you, his mercies are new every morning. I like bread, and, and, and when I was a kid, I could wake up to the smell of my grandmother's fresh baked bread every mm -hmm. morning, you know, and God's mercies are fresh like oh, that, you know. And uh, it, it's good to know that because I'm human, I'm frail. And I don't, I don't always make the mark, you know? And, and when I miss the mark, it's nice to know his mercies are there and yeah. they're fresh all and, the time. And it's interesting that when you see that verse quoted, you read the verse, it's very inspiring. It's, the book of Lamentations is where that came from? That's <laughs> yeah. not where people would guess. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I, but I also love that verse that you, you mentioned earlier about uh, Jeremiah, mm -hmm. about um, 2911, how mm -hmm. does that go again? Um, about, plans I have. yeah, I, I know I the know plans, the plans I, have I have for you, plans, plans to prosper to you and, and to not to you harm you, not to harm you. Plans to give you, I think it's hope in a future. Better future. Right. Yeah, that, I, I had a very low spot in life at one time in my life and I held on to that scripture for dear life. Mm -hmm. It carried mm -hmm. me through just that one I, verse. I have that scripture posted on the wall at my house. Just, so I read it every day. Mm -hmm. yeah, it, we, we do need tangible things to remind mm -hmm. us and I think that's where the church has a responsibility then as the body of Christ even though you can't always see God the Father I think the reality of the church is to step into that place and to share love and encouragement and comfort I think when a person's going through a hard time the invitation and encouragement to find that church family should be one of those places to say this is the group of people who will surround you with God's love who will make God's love real to be a body like it mm -hmm. says yeah mm -hmm. you know I, I think, too, sometimes God isolates a Christian from friends and family just so that they can get to know him better. Mm -hmm. And sometimes when we're worried about the fact that, well, nobody's paying me any attention, nobody's checking on me, and God might be saying that this is the time where I want you to get to know me. So regardless of what your circumstances are surrounding, mm -hmm. you know me and you know I'm here. And that can be a tough time. Mm -hmm. That can be a really tough time. And sometimes we, we feel that it's other folks' fault because they're not paying us attention. And we, we fail to put that situation, or, or point that situation toward God, and He wants us to Himself sometimes. What, 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 why don't we talk about your stories in life and perhaps some of the things that have made you note the reality of God in your lives? How about if we start with you, Pastor? Well, I was raised in a Christian home. My father was a pastor. I'm. Uh, Are you a PK? I am a PK. <laughs> guilty as charged. <laughs> um, but you know, there came a time when I had to uh, decide for myself whether I was going to follow mm -hmm. Christ. And uh, the Lord became very real in in that decision making process. And uh, knowing, you know, what I had been taught as I was raised and coming to that decision that I was going to follow that way myself brought a lot of peace and freedom. It's a blessing. Good, very good. <laughs> yeah, praise God. A, a similar sort of testimony being raised in the church but then going to college and walking away from it. Mm. Oh really? Uh, but mm. then early in my time uh, at college I had a friend who was killed in a car accident mm. Mm. and it was really at her funeral that mm. it suddenly I realized it wasn't just for little kids that now as an adult I had to make my own decision yes. and, and I remember at that funeral and then coming back to a Bible study that I swore I'd never do a Bible study and then after that funeral I came back and said I need to make this decision and it was in that prayer and that time of discernment that Christ became real to me in my adult life as a savior that I needed. 
Well, not, 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 not to continue the theme, but I also had a friend killed in a car accident when I was in high school. And I can remember, that, like you said, that's when it went from being a thing little kids do to a thing that adults do. That was the moment for me as well. When, when now I had to use the Bible stories and the stuff I'd learned from the felt boards in church and all that stuff, that stuff now had to speak to me in a way where I'm looking at my friend I went to school with there in the casket. I just, it was just one of those things where um, then I knew it had to work. It, this has to work because uh, there, there is nothing else. If this doesn't work, there's nothing else. And, and then I came back and, and I was actually in college, went, went to college because it was my senior in high school that happened. I went to college and uh, I took a class on the book of Job actually. And, and the book of Job says, you know, sometimes life really falls apart. And, and Job, even though he got an explanation toward the end of the book from the whirlwind, I don't know that that explanation would have made Job go, man, I'm glad my kids are dead and I'm glad. I, I don't know that Job ever got to that point. However, uh, Job was the one who was identified as faithful and that's what brought him through. And uh, that's, that's why I'm here today is so that I can help people kind of walk along with, uh, you know, through bad times in their life like that as well. And your story? Um, I was not brought up in a pastor's home. Neither did I have the privilege of having that covering. I was brought up in a religious home, an um, Anglican home. Mm -hmm. And so when I, when I got saved at age 15, it was so dramatic, it was so impactful that I understood that I needed my family to come to know the Lord in a personal way because religion was coming in between. Mm -hmm. And so my greatest desire, the mission that I went on as a young girl was to live a life that would authenticate mm -hmm. my testimony. Mm -hmm. And I wanted my family, my mom and my dad, my seven brothers and sisters, to come to know Jesus Christ. That was the greatest desire in my life. And so I fought to live for God. I'm so thankful to God today that my testimony is all of my family are serving the Lord. Wow. And so I say to young people, when sometimes you're alone in the family that are serving God, it might not be others, God might have touched you. Don't give up. I learned to, to find a place in God to draw from. I learned the importance of the church community. I learned how valuable it was to have Christian friends around me mm -hmm. that was gonna help to usher me into my destiny. Mm -hmm. And so I will encourage anyone that is struggling to do that. Yeah, that's great. It's always good to hear some of the background of, of, of ministers where you come yes. from. I too came to Christ when I was 15. Praise so God. So I, I, I know that situation and, it, uh, and I did not grow up in a uh, Christian home. Yeah. My grandmother, who lived not too far away, was a Christian and, and began to teach me about the Lord on her knee when I was about mm. five years old. And mm. it never left me. And even when I went out into the world, she said, I'm going to continue to pray for you. That's I said, right. well, I'm going to do my thing. That's right. But when I became 15, her prayers reached out and they arrested me in the name of Jesus. Mm. And, and I came to the Lord and uh, haven't looked back since. Praise haven't God. looked back since. Praise God. Another question here I think we need to take a look at. Um, how do we know to give to the poor and when not to give to the poor? Sometimes we are enabling them by giving. That's what this question reads. And I, I, I must confess, I've had that struggle sometimes. Mm -hmm. Should I, shouldn't I? Is this person on the street begging for money because they have a drug addict or they want to go buy some alcohol? Or are they really going to take this money home and go spend it to family? Does it really matter? Do I have the responsibility to God or one way or the other? How do you deal with that? I, I think uh, if you're going to give charity like that, I have two rules I follow by. I, I, well, actually one rule boils down to I don't give money to anything that I don't know where it's going. So if somebody I know comes to me, I, I would help them. Or if an organization I know comes to me, we certainly would help them. But if I'm driving down the street, you can call me callous, but I don't feel a lot of compassion. I just, because I'm concerned about what I'm enabling. Uh -huh. in that moment. Yeah. So I, I think that 
you, we, we need to be good stewards of what God has given to us. And the way we, we are good stewards is we know what happens to that money once we hand it over. At least have a good idea yeah, what happens to that yeah. money once we hand it over. And, and it doesn't mean that you're not charitable. You, right. you just don't oh, want to yeah. contribute to a person's problems. Exactly. I want to make sure I'm helping. Yeah. I, want, I, want to I want my giving to help. I don't want it to make something worse. Yeah. I like, agree with you, my brother. Um, and there are also some scriptural guidelines that I use in my life. Proverbs 19.17 says... Whoever is generous to the poor lends to the Lord. Mm -hmm. That was a revelation to me. When you lend something, you're expecting it back. And so I, 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 have, I have governed my life over if I, if I lend it to the poor. If I'm giving to the poor, we have a soup kitchen at our church mm -hmm. and a food pantry. And that's our motto. If we give to the poor, like you said, you want to know where your mm -hmm. funds are going. We know where it's channeled. We know what we're doing. And we feel like God is going to give back to us, mm -hmm, pressed on, mm -hmm. shaken together, mm -hmm. and running over. Hebrews 13, 16 says, Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. So there is another one that we can use as a guide mm -hmm. for us in 1 John three seventeen. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does, the God, how does God's love abide in him. Mm. Those are guidelines for us as mm -hmm. Christians to make those determinations. Mm. Excellent. Well, I love the verse you read from Proverbs about uh, giving to the poor is to lend to the Lord because uh, when a bank loans money out, they expect it back with interest. Mm -hmm. When you lend to the Lord, he's going to pay you oh, back with interest. Yeah. <laughs> and I love yeah. that, yeah. That, uh, that truth. Um, and it is difficult to know. Yeah. Um, Ultimately, the responsibility for us is to give and be generous. And I, I can't always control, even when I know that the organization I'm giving the money to uh, is worthwhile, they might give it to someone that's not worthwhile. I can't control that, mm -hmm. but it's up to us yeah. to, to be good stewards as well. Okay. Yeah, not a question of should we give to the poor, yes. only a question of how Yes. and finding those organizations and ways to do it best. Yes, yes, I agree. And it's always, you know, I, I see a lot of the large Christian organizations are members of this evangelical, I can't think of the full name, EC. ECFA. FA, yep. yeah. And that's a good accountability system, but that's for large organizations. But I do agree with you. We, mm -hmm. we as good mm -hmm. stewards of what God has given us, mm -hmm. have an we obligation have to. to look into and investigate where mm -hmm. the money is going. And, we have um, to. And even if it's a person on the street, like you said, I, I, I'm, I'm a little leery sometimes. That, that's me. I, I, I'm, I'm leery because I just don't know what's going to happen. Just don't know. So, well, we, we have a, a, about a minute left. Anybody have any closing comments before, any closing thoughts before we uh, <laughs> leave for today? Just thanks for having us on. Yeah, appreciate being here. <laughs> a wonderful yeah. ministry to have discussion. So <laughs> yes. whether it's taped or not, always a joy yeah. to be with yes. brothers yes. and sisters and yes. talking about the issues of the Lord. Yeah. Yes. And it, it's good to know, isn't it, that, that whatever the issues might be, that there is a biblical perspective yes. that we can look to. Yes. The Bible is so all-encompassing. Mm. And I think another marvelous thing is the fact that though it was written, some thousands of years ago. Well, it was written over a 1500 year period mm -hmm. by several different authors that is so relevant so in this relevant. 21st so relevant. century. Still, mm -hmm. so relevant. Still so relevant. We thank God for that. God is so real. And you can look to that and know that God is alive and He is a real. We thank you for being with us and ask you to tune again next week. In the meantime, send us your questions so that we can address your questions here on a future program. Until then, I'm Bill Harris. Thank you for being with us. Bye bye. Thank you. You've been watching TV44's newest locally produced program, Life Questions. Now we'd like your feedback. What did you enjoy about this show and what would you like to see more? Perhaps you have your own questions you'd like us to pose to our panel of pastors in a future show. Submit your questions now by email to lifequestions at wtlw.com or call us with your thoughts. We're able to discuss relevant topics with local pastors right here in the TV44 studio thanks to your financial support. Now is an excellent time to make a one-time gift to TV44 or consider becoming a monthly donor. 
100% of your donation stays right here at TV44 and is used to spread the family-friendly, life-changing message of Jesus Christ. Secure donations can be made online at WTLW.com, by phone, by mail, or in person. Again, share your questions for consideration for future shows or just contact us with your comments at lifequestions at WTLW.com.